Hey y'all, it's your host, Avery Carl. Welcome to the Short Term Show special episode series on Scottsdale, Arizona. So in these 10 episodes, we are gonna take a deep dive into the Scottsdale market, but I wanna note a couple of things for you guys first. So if you are looking for current income numbers and current purchase prices, or you wanna set up a search of Scottsdale properties, You can do that at our website, theshorttermshop.com. You can also connect with us there to get connected with our Scottsdale agents or any of our other markets, any agents in the other markets that we work in. So hope you guys enjoy our Scottsdale mini series and we'll catch you guys later. Be sure to join our Facebook group. It's called Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. Same title as my book. And we'd love to connect with you there as well. Thanks guys, let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show special episode series on the Scottsdale market. We have several very familiar faces here. We've got Leslie and Jessica, who you know from all of the previous episodes that we've done, but we also have the illustrious Mr. Rob Abasolo. Rob, for those who are not familiar with you, which there probably are none of those people, but (laughs) <laughs> Introduce yourself anyway. <laughs> uh, well, first and foremost, I am a client of the short term shop. Uh, the favorite client, I hope. Um, I'm oh, yes, also the the creator behind the Raw Built YouTube channel, which is the largest Airbnb channel in the world. And I am also the co host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is the uh, the largest real estate podcast in the world. So I've got um, you know uh, I've got the great honor of educating people. In the world of real estate, Airbnb, tiny places, unique spaces, and everything in between. Quite a resume that you've got. And we really, really appreciate you taking the time to be on our show. Hey, happy to be here. (laughs) And uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's get started. So today, what we're talking about is setting up your property. So all the episodes up until now are more about buying and closing and choosing and all that. Now we're going to talk about getting into the process of owning and managing. But before you do that, you have to set it up. So when we buy a property in this market, let's, let's, uh, well, I was going to say, let's assume that they come furnished. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. We'll get into that in a minute. Mine did. I, yours did or didn't? Yeah, it it did. It did. That makes it so much easier, doesn't it? Mm, <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> I thought it would. Usually I'll say this in the Smoky Mountains and Blue Ridge, way easier because those mm-hmm. usually the furniture style and all that stuff is pretty like you know, cohesive with the style of the Smoky Mountains. Mm -hmm. We bought a property out in Scottsdale. We negotiated the furniture in from someone that wasn't running the property as an Airbnb. And that ended up being like a pretty fatal mistake on our end. But we can get into that in a little bit. Yeah. Well, I was, well, let's go ahead and get into that. I was going to talk about locks first, but we'll get into locks in a little bit. Let's hear about that because I could see how if, you know, it was a primary home and somebody had kind of like grandma furniture or something. You tell me what happened. Let's hear. Well, so this was a, you know, not this last June, but the June right before. So like about a year and a half ago, uh, something like that. And problem was that we negotiated this property and we we negotiated pretty well. Um, we we put in not a low ball offer, but an aggressive offer. And they kind of told us to kick rocks. And, um, you know, we were like, okay, whatever, let us know. And we, we did a negotiation tactic, which we call like put them on ice. And we just kind of like realtor reached out a couple of times to sort of ghosted them for about a week or two. And then we finally reached out and we're like, Hey, now we're ready to talk. And they ended up accepting basically the offer that we, that we put in. And part of that offer was the furniture. We wanted all the furniture of the property minus like whatever they felt was like sentimental and important to them. Right. So I think on both sides, we were both kind of saying sucker (laughs) because like, we're (laughs) like, yeah, we're getting all the furniture. And they were like, haha, they're getting all our old furniture. Cause in the photos, you know, Real estate photos tend to look nicer than what the actual house is most of the time. And there was just a lot of furniture that wasn't really cohesive to the style of the house or cohesive to like typical Airbnb templates, you know, t- Airbnb design palettes and everything like that. And so when we got into the house, um, we knew we were going to have to spend, you know, some money to spruce it up, let's say like 30,000 bucks or so. And then it turned out that just everything was kind of old and yeah, grandma-ish, smelled like a Goodwill. It was all like very teal blue, like a very beach color in Scottsdale. There were no oranges, nothing like that. So for we gave ourselves four days to set up this property that was already furnished because like, yeah, easy. And uh, it turned out that the first two days, really, we spent taking everything, most of the stuff out of the house into the garage to just give away or sell. And then the other two days, the other two days we basically spent at World Market and like all these different places buying everything. And so if I were going to do it over, it's either you buy a place that has spectacular furnishings, like, you know, in the Smoky Mountains, for example, where you don't actually have to do much, 
or you buy it completely empty. We bought it with the furnishings because at that time, the supply chain was horrible for furnishings. And so we thought, hey, you know what? We're going to save three months on waiting for couches and beds and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be great. Uh, in retrospect, that was not what well, that wasn't the best decision. And so that was a, a lesson that I've learned the hard way. So now I honestly just kind of prefer to, to furnish from the ground up unless it's like Smokies and in Blue Ridge. Gotcha. So there's some markets where it's easier and some markets where it's harder. Yeah. So would you say you want to use like a company like, or at least I probably will next time I have to furnish something from the ground up, like host GPO or Minoan, where they will kind of like do a lot of that for you. So you're not having to do so much coordination. Yeah. Yeah. Host GPO, we use them quite a bit and the discounts that they get, like, I think on one of my houses, I spent 50,000 bucks on furnishings and saved like, I don't know, like 14 or 15,000, something like that, right off of that 50,000. So we ended up spending 35 K total. And yeah, Minoan has a bunch of really great discounts. I mean, like when you use both of these services, which are super, super, super cheap, it's, it almost feels like a robbery to use these services because they give you like 20 to 50% off of a bunch of major brands. That's how I would do it, especially because they have design services that will come in and actually design your place. And then you can sort of pick and choose based on your budget. Yeah. I, I love those guys. I, I haven't had to do one in a while, but makes it so much easier. And then just the the cost aspect. So let's talk about decor and furnishing a little bit more. So my advice would be to use the enemy method and look at what the top performers comparable to your property are doing and look at what their decor looks like and their furniture and make sure yours is on par or better than that. This is not a market where you can get away with oh, I went to the thrift store and I pieced together all of these things. This is a very, there's a lot of sophisticated operators in Scottsdale, like Rob. So you want to make sure that you are paying good attention at the beginning, enemy methoding the decor and the furniture, making sure that it is what it needs to be. Um, Rob, do you have any more advice about that? Yeah, well, I will just say, I am now a sophisticated operator in in, (laughs) uh, Scottsdale. I I wasn't when I got there. You know, I, I sort of made a bunch of mistakes. I think the enemy method is really pretty spot on, right? Like look at your competition, examine them, see what they're offering. I think the big mistake I made going into that market was the house itself is on five acres. It's a 6,000 square foot Spanish mansion and it's really majestic. And I was like, oh yeah, I mean, the architecture is really going to be why people book this place. Um, And my competition's houses nearby that are the same size aren't nice at all, but they were crushing me. And it's because they offered amenities and they had pickleball courts and pools. I mean, you know, they had a lot of different amenities, not not all expensive ones. I didn't have any of them. And so when I wasn't booking, I was like, well, what the heck? And so I started looking at my competition and realizing architecture is really only significant when the amenities sort of match that that architecture. And so that was like a hard lesson for us, but we've since turned it around and like the property is doing pretty amazing now. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Good yeah. news. So, I mean, what are some common amenities that we probably need to have? like at any tier property. So Rob, I know yours is like huge Mm -hmm, top mm -hmm. tier has everything. So do a lot of these properties, even the smaller ones, like two, three bedrooms come with pools. Do we need to have those? Can we get away with not having them? What do you guys think? I think there's a large selection of properties um, that do come with pools. It's not a bad idea. I I highly encourage having a pool. I mean, we are, we're the desert. We have 10 and a half really good months. I feel But, you know, we do have some hot months. And so if you're getting visitors during that season, you it's worth it to have, you know, have them comfortable and and have something for them to do outside. And so a pool is like a large piece of that puzzle. Yeah, uh, I would even say on the flip side of that. So it's either like you you don't have the pool. All right. There's probably other ways you can make up for it. Um, I rarely tell someone to go and make a ninety thousand dollar capital investment into their Airbnb. I'd rather someone just find a property with the pool than buy a property and spend 90 grand. So I would say the easiest thing you can do if you have a pool that would definitely increase your revenue is add a pool heater. I think that's actually pretty critical because the busy seasons, the shoulder season, I think begins around November. So that's kind of like where things start to ramp up. And then December through May is basically like the big season. It's not really all that hot in those months uh, up until probably May or so. So a lot of people really want that that heated pool. And that's its own set of frustrations because like people think heated pools mean hot tubs, but it really Mm -hmm. just means that your pool is 85 degrees, which is like a little a little colder than bath water, basically. So that's 
been its own frustration, but we're we're kind of learning how to maneuver that with guests. Um, it cost us, I want to say, oh man, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's not super cheap to to add a heater. It was either I wish I had better numbers. Maybe y'all know it was either three thousand or ten thousand to edit a big heater. Any chance y'all know the answer to that? I think it's actually a range. It depends on what type, the brand, how large. Um, so yeah, I think that's a pretty decent range. Yeah. yeah it's it's like closer to three answer. in Florida. Okay. I got a gas one. So I think depending on what you do, ours is a pretty good size pool. So, I mean, it guess it like anything depends on the quality of it, but it costs me closer to three. That might be where we were at. I'd say too. Um, I've seen this on properties uh, here in Arizona and mostly on uh, nicer properties, but they also have um, a system that cools the pool, which Mm. might be really cool in the summertime and something that not everybody has. I don't know how much it costs, but if you were going to already go ahead and add the heater, maybe you could go ahead and add the, you know, the, the system to cool the pool in the summer. But yeah, uh, that's a really cool feature because it the pools, especially if the pool is a small play pool, which mm-hmm. we have a lot of here, then they they heat up in the summertime quite a bit. So it can be it can be awesome to have a pool cooler. I've seen those. Um, I've actually seen more like rigged TikTok versions. It's like this little like PVC system that you like put into it, and then it like circulates all the hot air from the pool, and they're like a couple hundred bucks. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, or if there's like a more. I'm sure there's a more sophisticated version too. Um, but that, that's honestly, I think that's a great call. Uh, so between the pool heating and cooler pool, I think that's an important amenity. Um, I'm curious what y'all think. Cause I actually don't have a hot tub. We're wanting to add a hot tub. How important do you think hot tubs are in the Scottsdale market? It does increase, um, the value that you can charge, um, if you have a hot tub versus not having one. So whether or not you absolutely need it, I guess that's just, dependent upon how much you're wanting to make from your nightly rates. Sure. Well, you know, cause like in the Smoky Mountains, hot tub is right. a huge requirement. I just, I didn't have a hot tub in the Smoky Mountains for a very long convoluted reason that, yeah, <laughs> I, I have one now. And uh, in the Smoky Mountains last year, my property grossed 5,000 bucks, I think. This year in November, it grossed $9,500. So I added $4,500 in November just from adding my hot tub which, you know, it's it's a whole like setup too. It's it's very cool. So in the Smoky Mountains, it's kind of like a non-negotiable. Um, in Scottsdale, it does, it feels, I don't want to say it's uh, negotiable, but it does seem in general in any market that you had a hot tub to, it typically going to add the stat, I think is like up to $49 to your ADR, your average daily rate on, on whatever you usually charge. It's definitely a perk to have it. I'd say yeah. if, if it does come with one, the better. If it doesn't, you may want to consider adding one at some point. Yeah. And they're not terribly expensive, just depending on what you get. Um, all right. We're, so we have okay. Costco that's like easily accessible and, uh, you know, they have great deals all the time. I don't know how how well they perform, but I hear people that buy Costco hot tubs. And yeah. They love them just fine. So. Oh, yeah. And they've got know, an amazing the, warranty, too. Yeah. That's the convenience of, you know, our market is that we have a lot of these, you know, bigger chain stores that are easily accessible and shipping is fairly easy and things like that. That's nice. I don't own anywhere where there's chain stores and easy <laughs> shipping and all this. <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So, so Rob, let's talk about, let's get into the, the stocking of things. So we've touched on amenities, obviously better amenities equals higher income. Um, so let's talk about stocking. Let first, before we get into some of the smaller things, there's three key pieces of hardware that I like to talk about your smart lock, your smart thermostat and your smart cameras. What kind of a, well, let me back up guys. If you are buying a property and it already has a smart lock on it, change it anyway. Anytime you're buying a property, I don't care what it's for, if it's a primary or not or whatever, always, always, always change the locks. You don't know how many people have access to if it's even if it's a hard copy key, there could be a thousand. There could be a thousand handy people mm-hmm. that have that. There could be you don't know how many codes the initial smart lock had. If you don't reset it right, just get your own. I even though you can reset those things, like I'm just a big fan of getting your own. I've seen too many buyers like make mistakes that we won't get into uh, with not changing their locks. So number one thing, change your locks. Rob, what kind of locks do you get? Uh, I believe we use like the, uh, well, it depends on the property, right? Because it's always a little different. But I think on that one, we actually have the Slage, Slage, Sloggy. I don't know. Yeah, see, slage. nobody um, knows. Slage, Slog, uh, 
Slage, slage. I have the yeah, slage uh, on code on that one. It's either that one or we also do like the Yale net, like the Yale nest mm-hmm. one. Um, but they're definitely a smart lock. Uh, I don't know. I think it is. It's okay. It's either a, a slage uh, on code or a slage mm-hmm. smart sense. Either of those still kind of sync up with the, uh, with whatever I think with guesty for host, that's what we use. Okay, cool. That's we use the schlags too. And then we've, have on and off use the Yale plus Nest or Nest plus, I think it's X, not a plus, whatever. That Uh, one, yeah, yeah. That one too. Both of them have worked great for us. So there's a problem with that one though. If if we use the same one, it's like the, it's the sleekest one on the market. It's like this really nice rectangular, or it's not rectangular, oval one and it looks super sleek, but there is no key on it. And so I've actually run into issues where that has died and like the only way to revive it is to go buy a battery, like a nine volt and put it under and like, it's a whole thing. Um, because that is your dead bowl. And if there's, I think the number one tip I can give to someone is if you have a dead bolts, like a smart lock, 100% of the time, make sure that that, that smart lock dead bolt has a key option to it, like a keyed option. If it doesn't have a keyed option to it, you will find yourself SOL when a, when a guest is there and it dies. It's happened to me one, one too many times. That is a really, really good point. And you never know what's going to happen. We had a guest one time who came home hammered and did the like one eyeball the door code too many times until the lock died. And so luckily that one wasn't on code and we had the we had a key off, you know, somewhere else. But you never know what can happen, especially it, this probably wouldn't happen in this market, but in some markets where like near the ocean, things corrode really easily. So you got to always have the option of a hard copy key for sure. Oh, yeah. I'll give you the example of what happened to me because, you know, backup to a backup, <laughs> right? Yep. I had that on my front door and then it was <laughs> the, the battery didn't even die. OK, it was perfectly working. I had that on my front door. I had that in my back door. So guests in the in the house, they're like, hey, let's leave. They lock that lock. And then they're going down through the back door where the garage is and they lock that deadbolt and then <laughs> they left through the garage. And so I don't remember what happened, but for whatever reason, they couldn't get in because they went through the garage and they locked. Oh, no, they locked the deadbolt above the smart lock. It was something like that where there was no key option. Like we never used that deadbolt. And uh, we didn't take your advice, Avery, on that because I bought that house so long ago. But <laughs> I think that was like an older deadbolt or something. Or maybe I had the key here with me. But regardless, the fact that there wasn't a key really ended up being like a treacherous thing. It was Sevierville. There weren't any locksmiths available for like two night, like for like the next night. One guy said he was going to come and then he, he was like, I'll be there in an hour. And he never showed up. And so, yeah, I, long story short, I had to refund the guests because they were a little unhappy. So they broke <laughs> into the window. Oh, it happens. Happens to the yeah. best of us. Yeah. Um. All right. So now let's talk about smart thermostat. Which one do you use? Uh, the Nest. Yeah, Nest seems to be the overall like the friendliest, the easiest to lock, and all that kind of stuff. Really? See, I'm we are Honeywell people because the Nest like wants to try, and maybe we're doing it wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong. Wants to try and like learn behavior so that it can automatically be at the temperature that you want it to be at. Yeah, that is annoying. I think you can lock. (laughs) I think that's the eco mode, and you have it is way harder than it needs to be to turn that off. Uh, so I think we've had that issue before, but I think we, I think you can turn that off. I think, but yeah, that one, I've also had some issues. I actually just took the nest out. Actually, I'm glad you said this. I took the nest out of my Sevierville property because the wiring on that property didn't send enough power to the nest. And so we actually went to through two nests or maybe even three. And I just was like, I was like, screw it. And I just went to an old fashioned thermostat on, on that specific floor. Cause they kept, <laughs> it was the only thing that was compatible with the wiring, but generally we do nest. Yeah. And we don't do smart thermostats that you can uh, that you can work from off site remotely. Why can't I think of that word that you can use remotely to like mess with the guests and make sure they have it below a certain temperature or above a certain temperature. It's really more so we can keep up with, hey, is the HVAC working? Because if you look at it and there hasn't been anybody in there for a few days and it says it's set to 70 and it's 100 degrees outside and it's at 80, well, then, you know, you probably need to go get your your HVAC looked at. So it's really more of like a monitoring thing and not a being weird with the guest temperature thing. But I think, you know, if you can definitely need to to have one of those just so you can kind of keep up with things before your HVAC goes out while a guest is in house and you have to refund them and and they're mad at you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, well, also just to protect the guest from being dumb, because this happens all the time, too. (laughs) It's always my Sevierville property. This one really, honestly, 
is not that bad of a property. It's just, I don't know. I always have bad luck with guests, but guests think that if you put the thermostat down to like 57, you're, it will make your house colder. And that's not really how ACs work. And so <laughs> I've had guests that have done that because they're like, it's not getting colder. Let's put it down to 57 and they leave it running that way and they actually freeze the coil. And so you want to like have settings in your thermostats that basically stop a guest from overcooling your place. And when, you're, when your coil freezes, there's literally nothing an AC tech can do until that coil melts. And I've had that happen a couple of times at that property too, which is why we ended up just switching over to smart stuff to just lock guests out. It has to be done sometimes. Yeah. So now the third piece of hardware that we keep are ring cameras, doorbell cameras, or sometimes we'll do the floodlight cameras on if for some reason the doorbell doesn't work. Not the actual doorbell. I mean, like having it right there doesn't work. Uh, so what do you guys use? I can say I use I use ring. Yeah. I use ring floodlights ring. and I use the ring doorbell. Mm -hmm. um, I have started switching over to the Google Nest, or I think it's the Nest. Maybe it's just the Google doorbell. And I like that one a little bit more because I like the way their notifications are. Like the Google Nest one will send you a notification that says your front door thinks it saw a package retrieved. So it kind of clues you in on if you get a package and it's like, wait, I'm not there. Who picked up my package and all that kind of stuff. So I like that. Um, not that I'm checking it vigorously. This is really just for my mostly my my primary house, but I like some of those settings and that optionality. Um, but the ring has always been great. And the floodlight is, is what I've used primarily. The ring floodlight, that is. Gotcha. And guys, that is not for you to spy on your guests. It's really just to refer back to if there's some kind of an issue. So we we had a client one time who ended up selling her property. She was just too high strung. This was not for her, but she saw on her, she was would watch her guests and like yell at them through the ring cam. And uh, I think the final straw for her was a guest was peeing off the front porch. This is out, you know, in the woods in the smoky. So it wasn't like in a neighborhood. And she hollered at him through the ring cam while he's peeing oh. off the porch. And so he felt really creeped out. And I'm like, you know, you're out in the woods. That probably yeah. wasn't going to hurt anything. You probably didn't have to do that. But anyway, don't be creepy to your guests with the cameras. You can only have them facing the front, nowhere else. And you do have to disclose that in your listing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just make make sure you use your cameras for good and not for evil. Yeah, I really don't. I mean, I don't know. So, you know, I've got like a pretty large amount of students in my program and they all ask the same question. They're all like, hey, like, you know, I just saw a guest come in. What should I do? They're like, should I, you know, or they said I saw eight guests come in versus seven. What should I do? That That question comes up every day. And I'm like, I mean, look, could you message them and say, hey, it's an extra 10 bucks? Yes, but just like, don't look at your cameras. <laughs> I only look yeah. at my cameras when something catastrophic happens. Uh, not not catastrophic, but whenever something like a guest complains about something big, whatever. Um, yeah, it's really meant to be like proof after the fact, not something that you really want to like worry yourself or concern yourself during a stay. Because at the end of the day, like if someone brings 10 guests versus seven, yeah, they kind of lied and maybe cheated you out of money, but it's just not worth like the possible four-star review, in my opinion. I agree. Not at scale anyway. Yeah. Those those extra three people were probably not going to single handedly burn the house down. So just chill. Um, <laughs> so now there are also three pieces of software that I recommend that you have. And almost every time uh, a client comes to me and says, hey, I'm not doing as well as I thought I was. What can I do? And we start looking and the property looks great. It's almost always because they are either missing or not properly utilizing one of these three. And that is your property management software, your dynamic pricing tool, and a digital guidebook. So for us, we use hospitable, hospitable, excuse me, for our property management software. We use Price Labs for our pr dynamic pricing, and we use uh, TouchStay for our digital guidebook. But what do you use, Rob? Uh, I use Hostfully for my digital guidebooks. Um, I've just used them really since, really since the beginning. So mm -hmm. um, I've always just thought they were pretty easy to use. Uh, I use Guesty for hosts for my just for my short term rental property management system. And then I also use Price Labs as well. Yeah. And actually, I think I might even use a hospitable on like, like one account because I've got like four different accounts. Um, and I think sometimes I just like to try different things. I, it'd be easier to use one. <laughs> but I think right. just for the sake of kind of staying nimble and like knowing my stuff. But oh, overall, I use Guesty for hosts. That's always been, you know, I've used them since back in the day when they were your porter. And I, honestly, I might have gotten that recommendation from you all back in the day, like when I was just getting started. Mm -hmm. We did use them for a long time. 
And they're all kind of similar. They all have they all have like their thing that they that they do the best better than anybody else. So uh, it really just is like what your comfort level is with which one of the property management software. I mean, there's hundreds of them, but the main ones I think are going to be um, hospitable, guesty for hosts, um, host away, hostfully is another one. You're using them as a guidebook, but they've got the mm-hmm. property management. Yeah, they've software expanded too. into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who else am I missing of the big ones? I don't want to leave anybody out and then get a. Oh. Owner res. Oh yeah. Is, owner res. Yeah. yeah. So owner res will do anything in the world that you want it to do, but it is very hard to get up and running. So keep Got that it. in mind. If you're new, I don't recommend starting with that. Maybe once you get to a few properties and get really comfortable, I would recommend starting with probably guesty for hosts. If you're, if you're new, it's very intuitive and sleek and easy to use. I think. Yeah. Uh, Avivo seems to be one that's Logify and IGMS. Those are like the other ones mm-hmm. that I hear used pretty commonly, but I would say I, I don't know what the biggest ones are, but I'd imagine guesty for host and hospitable are kind of like in the leads. But honestly, I don't know. I've never, I've never looked into it. Yeah. I just I stick with what I know. So you got to have those three pieces of hardware, those three pieces of software. Now let's talk about what we're putting inside the house in terms of stocking. So how many sets of sheets and towels do you buy per bedroom and bathroom? So I buy three sets and guys by set, I mean, what is out in the house when a when a set of guests come to visit. So a set of sheets would be, you know, one set of sheets in every bedroom, what's out in all the bathrooms for towels. So we like to have one set that's out, you know, prepared to use on the beds, in the bathrooms, one set in the owner's closet for in case of emergency. And then, you know, a dirty set that's maybe just been taken off of the beds and the and the bathrooms that the cleaner is is washing off site. So I would recommend at least three. But what do you guys do, Rob? Uh we do the three sets as well. Well, I think for towels, we just do one one towel per person or like per person that the house can sleep. And rarely we're like fully maxing that out. Um so I think that's what we do for towels specifically. For sheets, we always have two in the house, the one that's on the bed and then the one that's like if that something happens, the oh shit sheets. And then um the cleaners also have like a third set of sheets that they keep in launder. So I think they oftentimes take them offsite and launder those. Uh, however, the cleaning company that I use in Scottsdale actually provides all of the sheets, all of the towels. And so they're always, they're like a pretty big cleaning company. So that makes it pretty convenient. They are really expensive though. Um, but that's been a convenient one and it's almost necessary on a property of that size and it's a more luxury one. So I kind of, I pay a little bit more for the luxury convenience, but overall there's typically like two sets of sheets in the actual house itself. Gotcha. And so how many towels, I think you already said this. So per bathroom, you put one towel per the amount of people that the house sleeps. Yeah. Assuming it's not a beach property. Yeah. If it's a beach property, we also have one beach towel per person. So that they're not using white towels to go to the beach, especially because beach tar is like a very thing is a very real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, I don't like to leave. I mean, if you have 20 guests and you left out 40 towels, how many towels do you think those 20 guests will use? All 40. <laughs> yeah, they'll use all 40. So it's kind of like a, hey, you know, be wise with your towel. You know, you get one. You only get one in this life. <laughs> um okay so we got sheets and towels so do you let's talk about well what do you do for like throw blankets or couch blankets or quilts you know the extras how many of those do you because i for a while didn't even think about those and then the past few times i've been at an airbnb like with my kids and somebody wants to get on the couch and it's like five o'clock in the morning because somebody woke up really really early and is grumpy you want to be able to put them on the couch, like with a blanket and, you know, some grizzy or whatever the show is now that the kids like mine are into grizzy and <laughs> it's nice to have. And that's something that I didn't think about until I stayed in a few. What What are your thoughts? You know, that's a good question. I mean, it's all different. The more I've done, the more property I've launched, the less I try to rely on throw blankets because like I can never get a clear answer from cleaners on how often they wash the throw blankets. So I'm always like, if I launch one with throw blankets, I want to make sure they're getting cleaned. Um, so I think we have probably, we usually have like a couple of extra ones in the closet and then we have like a main one on a couch kind of thing. And then that's always kind of thrown in with all the laundry, but we don't, we try not to put them in every single room because then if you have to wash every throw blanket, yeah, it becomes like a whole load of laundry. So yeah, is that, is that kind of your standard procedure for throw blankets as well? Cause like quilts, 
I don't do quilts either because that's another, I know hotels don't wash quilts consistently, but I don't know. I guess I feel, I always feel a little better about like duvet covers because those do get laundered every single time. Yeah. So we kind of have them do like an eyeball thing. So we, the throw blankets are in a closet on a top shelf. So it's like if they, they can see it if they open the closet. So it's right there and available to them. Or if they ask about it, we know. But if they haven't, if you can tell they haven't been touched, we just don't, don't have yeah. them wash it. So then what about like, okay, so then do you like sprawl your throw blanket for pictures? And then when the pictures are done, you fold it up and keep it in the closet. And it's that actual part of the like staging when, when a guest walks in. You know, that's a good question. I know I it's, it's a hard one it, to answer because every property is a little different. Yeah. It's been so long since we've done pictures on anything that I don't remember anything about throw blankets. So I'm going to say they're probably just not even in the pictures. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, something to think about. I'm going to think about that now. I'm going to go look. I know. I'm going to um, go text all my cleaners. <laughs> So, so let's talk about the kitchen stuff because this is something that could take a while. What do you stock in your kitchen in terms of cookware? Are we going crazy it, or is it a chef's kitchen or are we doing just the basics? You know, you've got a set of pots and pans, you've got your utensils, you're like a, one of those Walmart things or target things of like cooking utensils, or are we going, are we going crazy here? I usually go crazy like on the, like at TJ Maxx, right? On the final thing. So I think there's like sort of the in, the initial set of what you need, which is pots and pans, plates, cups, cutlery, right? But the one thing that I find people ask for quite a bit is um, baking sheets. So baking sheets are like a really big plus up for all of your properties, and they are used often as well. Um, we don't do blenders, but we have done blenders. And rarely do people say anything. But yeah, we have a blender at a beach property which makes sense because I think at the beach people are making like margaritas and stuff and like alcoholic drinks with those blenders. And then where I try to fill in the gaps the most is when I say go to TJ Maxx, that's when I go to the back wall and I start buying things that would be like super convenient to have, which would be like lemon squeezers and um, I don't know, like kind of those types of things. But I'm not going crazy and in, in doing like a garlic press or anything like that. But like a can opener <laughs> would be a good one, like a, a wine opener so I try to get like the most convenient things that you need when you're like in a kitchen, but I don't go like super crazy and like a pizza slicer is not on my list, but if I see it in front of me, I will buy it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Do you do pizza slicers? Do you know? <laughs> uh, yes, because that is one of the most annoying things to not have when you need it. And that's just something that I, one of those other things that I discovered from Oh, I'm going to make him a frozen pizza. And then like, oh shit, I'm here. We are. We're going to use that's scissors. what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> that that's kind of that TJ wall, TJ Maxx back wall, uh, philosophy for me. Like if it makes sense, I get it. Right. Um, do you do blenders? Uh, beach properties? Yes. Because yeah. like you said, people want to use those for, for certain things, but you know, we don't get a lot of demand for blenders in our mountain properties. Uh, we do always, especially in our mountain properties, make sure we have a crock pot because, you know, people are going out hiking and stuff. They can put chili or roast or something in the crock pot that they do ask for that in, uh, or they have in our mountain market. So we like to, to keep those there. Oh, we do um, toasters. Toasters always seem to be a pretty big hit. We don't do toaster ovens and we have, we do, uh, we've done crock pots and we've done, uh, rice cookers as well. And those always seem to do well. The one thing I stopped putting in my Airbnbs, glass Tupperware. Um, oh, that, yeah. in, in theory, that was a great idea, but people literally steal that all the time. And then plastic Tupperware kind of accrues on its own, but it's always like stained red from like pasta, it feels like. So I don't even know if I, if I do that as much now too. So yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot to keep up with. I'm trying to think what else. Um, what about air fryers? Do you guys provide air fryers? No. No. no, I do an electric griddle. Much. They can use an oven. It's just the yeah. convection setting. <laughs> <laughs> I do um, Brita, uh, Brita filters or Brita pictures. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was another one that was like really annoying when I didn't have it. Now I can't think of what it was. I, you want to have multiple corkscrews and bottle openers. Man, what was that? I was just about to say one that was annoying when we didn't have uh, spatulas pizza. and cooking spoons. Yeah. Um, I want to know. So let's move on to coffee. I want to know in the guidebook what kind of coffee maker it is before I get there, because sometimes you can't see it in the picture. Sometimes it's not disclosed. It's not something I'm going to bother a host with. Personally, I'm not going to bother them out of their day and say, what kind of coffee maker do you have? But 
I have gotten to places before assuming it was one or the other type Keurig or drip and it's 11 o'clock and I'm dragging two screaming kids who are tired of being in airplanes and ready to go to bed. And then I realize that I've like the one thing that I need in life to keep functioning, to take care of these children is caffeine. And <laughs> I've gotten the wrong kind of coffee maker of, of coffee for what's in the unit. So uh, I like to have the dual. So nobody no matter what decision anybody makes, they have what they need, but we also make sure it's in that guidebook so they know ahead of time. But what do you guys do, Rob? We typically do drip coffee, I think. Um, unless uh, there are some properties that we have a Keurig where the cleaning company will provide like the first couple of cups or whatever. But in general, I think it's just easier to stock for a drip. Like there's less room for error, in my opinion, because when you buy ground coffee, uh, especially if you buy it like in bulk and you're putting it out per guest and stuff like that much easier to have that on hand i think versus yeah i think keurig's it's an expensive amenity to have in my opinion so i think we typically do we definitely provide at a minimum a drip coffee and then um what's the other one? oh and coffee filters and then we provide some sort of like ground coffee yeah so we say we're, we like to keep it complicated well we do the dual thing but we will provide um, ground coffee, but it's bring your own K-cups because those are expensive. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, and it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's always a tough one because really I think for me, coffee is only relevant if there's like creamer and there's never creamer. So I never drink coffee at like hotels or at Airbnbs unless we went out and bought the creamer beforehand. I need creamer and sugar. I'm a baby. It needs to be like very <laughs> light brown coffee. It needs to be more creamer than coffee. Oh, ooh, I can't do that. But yeah. that's like I, my husband. He he's like a <laughs> splash of coffee. I'm like, oh, that's gross. Yeah, a splash <laughs> of coffee. I embarrass Luke so bad on road trips because sometimes they're like, I like iced coffee, and sometimes McDonald's is the only thing. There's no Starbucks, whatever. And at McDonald's, they always put way more creamer than coffee. It looks like brown tinted milk. And I will, mm, I always delicious. just say, can, can I have it black? And then can I have a, a cup of the creamer on the side? And he's already like, why are you being so high maintenance at McDonald's? <laughs> and so they always, and I, and I'll take it back and I'll be like, Hey, I'm so sorry. I know this is like so terrible, but can we, can you please just give me a black one? And he's like, Oh my God, you're returning food at McDonald's. That's <laughs> just stop. But I just it black than straight milk. Anyway, give me, give me the milk. <laughs> so what we do is we like to provide some grounds, some uh, filters, and some like individual packets of some kind of sweetener and some kind of non-dairy creamer. So if people are like in a bad way, there's something there. It might not be their favorite, but it's there. Uh, and yeah. Some people go, you know, do the full coffee bar thing. We don't do that. Do you guys do that? I do. No. Yeah. Do? Oh, really? Okay. I, I, I appreciate it. So I provide it. I have the duo. So it's, you know, whatever your choice is, you have the options. And then I do have the little cups of um, the creamers. A variety. I do like hazelnut, you know, French vanilla. I okay. have two different kinds of sugars because you never know. Um, but they're all like, you know, the little packets that you know, I don't like the big stuff where somebody has to go in there and scoop. So I try and do, you know, yeah. things that are a little bit more convenient. But so, I do offer all of that. I have the syrups. That's probably the only thing that would be shared, but it's got the squirt thing. So I don't feel like it's bad. Um, but yeah, I do provide like the little mini, um, grounds, like individually packaged ones. Um, I get them on Amazon. So it's like bulk and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, pretty for me, I, I feel like it's an amenity that I'd like, um, cause I have a smaller place in, in, uh, Sevierville. So I'm going to say at Leslie's Airbnb. I mean, I appreciate, <laughs> I have, you know, different kind. like you could do a press or, you know, whatever <laughs> I've never used it, but you, I just want to appeal to every flavor of person, I guess. I mean, I like French presses too. Um, I usually provide a French press at a property and I never know if it's appreciated or not. But I, I, same. I, I, I like a good French press. That is my favorite form of coffee, I think. <laughs> as far as like grounds are concerned to Avery, what is, what, what is y'all's protocol on that? Like if you have a big jar with sugar and do you have like a big jar with grounds do you have to like empty out the grounds that's just always, that's always like kind of the the hard part with like at scale and kind of briefing your cleaners on like changing that stuff that's always like the the, the nightmare story for me in general with coffee which is why i don't like the drip as much the keurig is a lot safer is that like when a cleaner forgets to 
clean out the coffee grounds. Oh man, I've had that happen before and the guests are never happy when that happens. Yeah. So we don't have anything where they would have to scoop. So you can get on Amazon, like the one, not serving the one pot individual, like they just open it up and dump it in. So it's not like they're having to, it's not like you're getting a big industrial size can of coffee and they're scooping it. It's the, I think it's community brand, that Louisiana brand that we have. Anyway, it's just one, like it makes 12 cups, you open it, you dump it in and you throw it away. So everything that we do provide is like pre-packaged. So nobody's sharing scoops and doing all that. Uh, you know, indiv individual packages of sugar, not a jar, individual packages of um uh, the creamer if they want. So we're not, nobody's reaching hands in jars or like forgetting to, to change things out. Yeah. Community. It is community. I just looked it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So one more note in the kitchen and then we'll move on to TVs. Cause that's kind of a big one where guests can have problems figuring out how they work and then be mad at you. So spices and condiments. We are a no condiment business. I don't want anybody. I had a terrible experience in one this year where we were staying at it and there were all, there was all this food everywhere. Well, it was also the the owner didn't tell us that she lived there. Um, but it was like all these condiments everywhere that you know other people had used, and I just it really really grossed me out. No condiments, but we do provide like a one of those twirly rotating spice trees of dried spices for people to use. But that's it. What about you guys? Yeah. Uh, I tell my my cleaner to throw everything out in the fridge unless it's like the the Brita filter. And then we provide spices too. But See, honestly, these days, I think we provide less spices because I just don't, I don't know. I, I don't feel like they're ever used and then spi the spices go missing. So I think we just provide salt, pepper, and oil. Yeah, got to have the oil. I, that's something I always forget to buy when I'm going somewhere too. So that's nice to have. Yeah. All right. So what are we doing for smart TVs? I have Roku. I like them. We do Roku in every single room, all Roku TVs, not the Roku sticks because those tend to get up and walk away. Uh, but that way, the Roku remotes are interchangeable. So if they get switched up in different rooms, they'll still work. So we find that's the easiest way to not have problems with people understanding the TVs, et cetera. <laughs> Yeah, I try to get the TVs that have the Roku built into them, but then those end up, I always feel being a little bit wonky eventually. Like I have a Roku TV right now that just keeps messing up on me. So I think a Roku stick is always like my favorite. We did fire sticks for so many years. I have probably bought like a hundred fire sticks literally in the seven years of hosting. They just always break on me. They've always broken on me. And I like that. The reason that Roku is the best is because of the guest mode. And you can basically put it on guest mode. People put in the date that they're checking out and it logs them out of everything at the end of that date. That to me is just like the best feature for any oh, smart yeah. TV ever. I 1000% agree with that. Um, so that was the end of my bullet points. Is there anything that you guys feel like our listeners would benefit from hearing in regards to setting up a property in this particular market that we might not have covered? Rob, what do you uh, think about theming in Scottsdale? I get that question a lot. And... I mean, I know what my answer is, but, you know, you have a property. And so I'd like to hear your input on that. Yeah, I think Scott sells a particular one where you want to you want to jump into like the avatar of that property. And so uh, that basically just means the demographic of who's booking your place. And we honestly just don't or didn't have one when we launched. And that was like a big part of it. But I know that like I, I, I'm friends with this designer on Instagram. She's really amazing. Her Instagram's called It's Bridget Bitch. Which is like a very funny, very I funny love name. Her work. Yeah, <laughs> she's an amazing uh, designer, and she did uh, my buddy's uh, Airbnb in Scottsdale, and it's all like bachelorette themed, and it's pink, and it's got all these like really just amazing things for bachelorettes, basically. And they're they're they outperformed their projections by about fifty percent as a result. Um, so I actually hired her to design my Airbnb in Austin, Texas, which is also going to be an Airbnb. Uh, like a bachelorette themed Airbnb. It's got a pink pickleball court. It's called the pink pickle. And it's like a whole thing. So I think um, in Scottsdale, hmm, what? the pink pickle. <laughs> yeah. I, well, that's a great that play on words. It, it, it's, a, it's a great play on words. That's right. I'll, I'll leave it I at saw that. An Airbnb that um, it's kind of a thing, but I like big putts. Yeah. There um, you go. <laughs> And let me be clear, I consulted Bridget on this. This wasn't like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is a guy thinking of what would be sure, funny to yeah. women. Uh, funny. She is like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of plays on the bachelorette thing, but it, there's a pickleball court. So and it's and it's a pink pickleball court. So that's the idea. Um, and it's like still family, family friendly in a sense. Uh, but 
Scottsdale is important because like you're saying, like I like big put I like big putts is you, there's very specific people that travel there, right? There's families, there's bachelorette parties, there's bachelor parties is a big one. And so like from an amenity standpoint, if you went all in on the bachelor pad idea and you had like mini golf, uh, like a putt putt course, not an entire one, but just like a, a putt away, like a small little green. If you had like a golf simulator, if you really wanted to go crazy. Um, if you had those types of things that appealed to bachelors, that will probably be a very successful Airbnb for you, right? Same thing with pools, like you'd want to pool in that scenario. Um, I can't speak too much to the bachelorette theme. I don't know too as much as that, like what amenities, like I'll say in my Austin Airbnb, we're having like a selfie wall, which is like this um, vanity station with four different stools and there's mirrors and like lights that are on. And so we decided to make a bunch of different selfie walls for that house so that they could all take pictures and have a bunch of photo opportunities. But I think that that, that plays super, super well in Scottsdale. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a theme, but I think you definitely have to be very clear on who your visitor is. And when we launched our property, it was not clear. And now we've done this pickleball court and it's very clear to me that pickleball people are coming to book our place, given that revenue has absolutely exploded on that property. So now... I'm going to be working to really enhance the pickleball court and add bleachers and awnings and a bunch of different things and kind of go all out on that specific demographic. That's, That's cool. <laughs> and Scottsdale is like, I think, I think it would be relatively easy and I think inexpensive um, if you're already going to put turf grass in, or if you have like some kind mm -hmm. of dead space on your lot to put in a little putt, like putt putt. Mm -hmm. place golf place because i mean scottsdale is like golf capital of the world it's huge mm -hmm. here so um if they're not out golfing they can be in golfing so I, I think that would be huge exactly big that's a big amenity out there and so that's why most airbnbs you often see even if it's like a 10 by 10 square right like not very big there's yeah. usually some kind of mini golf in a majority of the airbnbs here or in scottsdale and so that's why you know it's very important to look at your competition and decide like who who is it that you're trying to appeal to the most and you've got to match up with the amenities of your competition in the area yes mm -hmm. all right anything else before we wrap up about this market and setting it up that you feel like people need to hear no that not, not for me that was that's actually pretty thorough i think scottsdale's a good place i think um i'd like to buy more out there i'm working on some some more creative finance deals out there so yeah excited to kind of like now that i've sort of cracked the code i'm excited awesome call us <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, Rob, if our listeners want to follow you, follow your journey in Scottsdale and beyond, where can they do that? Um, find me over at uh, Rob Built on YouTube and then Rob Built on Instagram. Uh, Rob Built on YouTube is like my long form content that teaches you how to get into the short term rental game. It's all my free stuff. My best stuff is my free stuff. And then Instagram is like the shorter, goofier version of it. If you like the weird reels, that's that's me. <laughs> Rob, how do you spell that? Uh, R O B U I L T. Rob oh, built it, but only oh. one B. It's spelled oh. like row built. Most people think it's row built. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. And guys, if you want to go ahead and get in the market to buy something in Scottsdale with Leslie and Jessica, you can email us at agents at the short term shop dot com. Or if you're not quite ready for all that, you can just join us on our Facebook group. It's called Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. Same title as my book. We also have a live Q&A every Thursday that you can join and ask us any questions that you want about short term rental investing. And you can sign up for that at strquestions.com. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.